Hey, hey pals. Welcome to Frame and Fiber. In this video, we are going to be talking all about bugs. Why in the world do I want to talk about bugs? Well, if any of you live any place on the planet Earth, you have to deal with bugs. <laughs> so specifically, I want to talk to you guys about the pests that are attracted to our beloved stash of yarn, fabric, and fiber. We need to combat them and we need to crush them. So I want to talk to you about some of the bugs that you will most likely see, how to prevent them or at least deter them, uh, and what you can do to help save your stash. So let's get into it. If you are new here, my name is Paige and I'm the owner of Frame and Fiber, which is a picture framing and yarn shop in Point Pleasant, New Jersey. And early on in my picture framing life. I owned my frame shop, but I also had a part-time job, which was doing the picture framing for a museum up in Jersey City. And part of my job was pest management. Uh, I worked in the registrar's office and had to monitor and track and record any of the pests that made their way into the museum, into the collections department, anything that could potentially destroy or damage the pieces that we had in the collections. I became very familiar with bugs, insects, that could potentially damage the things that we had at the museum. Bringing that information and that knowledge with me into my frame shop was great because I adapted or adopted the policies that they have set in the museum industry and I started using that in my frame shop and then I added yarn and became a part-time yarn shop and so it just kind of carried over. And so some of the pests that are attracted to paper and wood fiber is, are also attracted to animal fiber, our woolens and our silks, that type of insect. Uh, and then also I learned that some of the pests that are attracted to the foods that we have in our kitchens also cross over to the woolens and the animal fibers. So there's a few bugs that I'd like to talk about. Now, obviously, in the fiber world, we are all quite familiar with and petrified of moths. <laughs> Depending on where you are, there are different moths for different areas. I'm going to be speaking to two types of moths. Uh, both are clothes moths, but the first one is called a casing moth, and that is found, as far as the United States goes, more in the southern part of the country, where it's more warm and it's more humid all the time. Uh, and then there is the web-making moth, and they're just all over the United States. And they're specifically attracted to animal proteins, the fibers that are make up our stashes. And then there are the crossover pests that not only do they want to destroy our stash and our knitted garments, but most likely they're coming into our stash from another area of our home, such as the kitchen. Uh, and that specifically is a carpet beetle. Carpet beetles are, to me, a little bit more dangerous, not dangerous, more damaging than a moth, uh, just because they are harder to find, harder to see, and their damage is done in such a way that you might not notice at first. And they're everywhere in your house. They're attracted to food, fiber. They're attracted to the dust under your baseboards. They're attracted to, if you have pets, all kinds of interesting things. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> yes, this is gross. So let's talk about those bugs and describe, I'll give you a little description of each one. So first the carpet beetle, since he is my most, my most favorite of all of them. <laughs> Ew. Uh, the carpet beetle, it's actually kind of a cute little bug, if cute can be used to describe a bug. Carpet beetles are the ones that don't skeeve me out. The moths just totally skeeve me out. Um, but anyway, the carpet beetle, super small. So the carpet beetle itself is about a uh, quarter of an inch. No, a little bit smaller, more like three sixteenths. 
and then the larva is about an eighth of an inch. Now, the carpet beetle itself is not ruining your items, it is the larva. Across the board, if you see an adult insect, it's most likely on its way to lay eggs or has laid eggs and then is now going to die. Half of them don't even eat in adulthood, they just reproduce and then kick, a bu kick the bucket. It's the larva that is more concerning and they're also the grosser of all of the uh, life parts of the life cycle. So carpet beetles, they have that really cool markings on their back. They're super small. They do fly, but they don't fly for very far. You'll see them crawling. I mean, they could literally live in a light socket and crawl out and then go and find something to eat and lay their eggs. So they're hard to find. And then you've got your case making moths. Case making moths are like a brownish gray color and they have three dots on their wings and they're about three eighths to a half inch wide or long, their wingspan. They are long and narrow. They have long and narrow wings and they, they're called case making because their larva, which is, are yellow, they are in a case it's a silken case that they carry around with them as they crawl and do damage in your stash. <laughs> Ew. And then we have the web making moth, which is the one that I'm more familiar with. Um, like I said, the case making moth is down south and I don't see that one up in New Jersey. But the web making moth, or the webbing moth, it is much broader in our country. Like you'll see them everywhere. And then the, they're the little three eighths to a half inch um, big so it's really small with golden colored wings and they have like these little I should do a picture for you but they have like they have like red hair on their heads but they're so small you probably won't see their heads and if you see it you smash it so quickly that you probably wouldn't see that they have red hair anyway <laughs> but yeah so they're goldeny yellow shiny bodies so those two moths are specifically attracted to the fiber. It's the protein in the fibers of the wool and the animal fiber, which makes up most of our stashes. Uh, but the webbing moth lay their larva, their eggs in a cocoon and it's a silken cocoon and it'll be in between the fibers of the stash. So they look like they're more part of it, but um, the larva break out of that. So. Lovely. So those are your three bugs that uh, I personally monitor for at my frame shop, in the yarn shop, and in my house. There are pantry pests that you might think are moths that are going to eat your stash, but they're actually not. Um, what The biggest one that people confuse for case making and webbing moths are Indian meal moths, and they are prolific. Like, you will see them way more than you'll see a clothes moth for sure. One, because clothes moths do not like the light, and Indian meal moths do. So if it's flying around in the daytime, chances are it's an Indian meal moth or a tobacco moth, something like that. And they have more of a pattern on their wings and they're like a brownish red. So don't be confused and think all moths are bad. It's just those two that you really have to worry about. These three bugs, the carpet beetle, the case making, and the web making moths, all love the same things though. So from henceforth, we will just be talking about the insect in general and knowing that it's, it's kind of across the board. So, Let's talk about what bugs love. They love basically four things. Number one, they love darkness. The larvae want a dark space. They are versed to light. They love moisture. They love a very comfy, moist environment. They love not being disturbed. In fact, the less you have to do with them, the happier they are. <laughs> and food. That's your stash, people. That's your stash. So what can we do to deter these little pests from invading our beloved stash? Okay, let's start with sealing up your stash. So that's number one. Sealing them up. 
I use plastic bags. These are specifically the plastic bags that you get from, like when you buy pillowcases or linens for your bed or curtains, um, duvet covers, that kind of a thing. I hound my friends and family to save these for me because this is what I use. You can use Ziploc bags if you want to. I prefer to use things that I don't have to buy because, you know, using it twice is reducing its reuse, re oh, recycling, that's the word, <laughs> the, the three R's. And I like the zippery, just, I like this. I like that my stash fits in these nice. Um, you can use vacuum sealing bags. So the downside to the vacuum sealed bags and why I prefer these smaller bags is because when you're sealing up your stash, you should really try to seal them in small batches. So compartmentalize your stash. Because if you only have two skeins in here and you only have four skeins in here, and there happens to be a little traveler came and made his way in with one of these skeins, you are confining him to just these four skeins and not the other 4,000 in your stash. <laughs> So the smaller the bag, the you know, these are pretty uniform. So you can get, you know, I have a bunch that fit four, I have a bunch that fit six, and then I have a bunch that fit two. So sealing them up is super important because you will contain anything that may be potential, you know, damage, but also it's easier for you to monitor. And then when you have all of your stash sealed up and stored away, uh, you are creating a barrier. This plastic is the barrier that's keeping the bug away from its food because we all know bugs love food. <laughs> so keeping them sealed up is so important. The next thing is the climate. Climate controlling your stash is super important. Keeping it in the basement is not the best idea. Keeping it in an attic is not the best idea. Keeping it in an area that the temperature and humidity fluctuates is a bad idea. Now, you know, you have what you have and you have to work with it, right? So I don't have air conditioning in my home. In the summertime, when it does get super hot and humid in New Jersey, that could be an issue. But by keeping my stash compartmentalized, I am helping helping it a little bit uh, because each one of these bags when it's closed is its own environment and so I can I can control the inside environment of these bags by using these desiccant packets these packets you see them all the time when you order something that's been shipped and they throw them in there Paul Miller my husband he does a lot of 3D printing and he gets these in with all of his products that he needs. And so I take them and I throw them right in with my stash. And every bag that I have has at least one of these in it. These, the downside to these is they only last closed up in a, a small area like this. It probably only lasts about a year. And then you have to recycle it and reuse a new one. But they are inexpensive and you can get them on Amazon. You can get them from Uline. I will link in the down bar to anything that is, you know, all the links to about all the things that I'm talking about will be down there. Keeping that dry is super important. If you have um, a home that is climate controlled and keeping the humidity level low is optimal. So I monitor the humidity levels at my shop and I also monitor them here at the house. I use this right here see if I can get it to focus there we go this is a temperature and humidity monitor it is battery controlled and it can go any place it's pretty cool um, you can set the humidity level so when it gets too high it'll let you know Paul Miller uses this in the basement for where he does all of his 3d printing and I use this at the shop both upstairs by where I keep all of my yarn and then also in my basement at the shop where I do all of my woodworking because the wood that I store needs to be at its own temperature and humidity as well. So this is really, really, for me, a valuable tool. It's really inexpensive. I will link below to how much this costs. Okay, so to help you guys out with your 
bug monitoring and stash protection. I thought I'd give this little guy away. Like I said, I have a bunch of these. Paul Miller has a bunch of these. I have a couple at the shop. So this is an extra one. So I thought if you would like a little extra defense against all of the pests that could potentially invade your stash, this would be fun. So comment below. That's it. Just comment below. <laughs> and I will uh, draw this. The winner for this will be drawn probably by the next time I do a video. And I'll let you guys know who wins. Good luck! Okay, so another deterrent to keep the bugs at bay is disturbing them. Like I said before, they don't like being disturbed. Disturbing them is probably one of the best ways to keep bugs out of your stash and out of your knitted garments. Um, even better than everything I just mentioned because if you're moving things around and using them, the bugs don't have a chance at all. For whatever reason, if things are disturbed, they cannot survive. They cannot lay their eggs and the babies, can the larvae cannot eat. Moving your stash, your knitted items, don't leave them in the bottom of a drawer for a year on it, years on end, move them around. Your wedding shawl that you've had for 20 years, packed away in some shoebox in the basement, it's not the best place for it. <laughs> Keep your things in an area that you use. So for instance, in a drawer with other things that you shift around and you move around. Uh, your stash, if you have a closet full of yarn, specifically if it's not packed away in plastic, you should be taking them out periodically to let them see the daylight, to let them move around, and then moving them back in in different kind of positions. It's also a good idea to have a shelf, which I don't have any yarn on right now, but a shelf where you like to see all of your pretties and then rotating out so you can see them. Again, I am a big proponent of stashing your yarn in plastic bags or at least compartmentalized bins, anything to keep them segmented so you can <laughs> control. But if that's not what, how you roll or if it's just not at your disposal, at least move your stuff around pretty often too. Um, I would say quarterly, like so that's four times a year. Okay, so You've done all of that, right? Your plastic bags, you're making sure that the humidity is attended to, you're not allowing things to sit around for too long, you're putting things away clean, not dirty, because the dirty stuff is what attracts them as well. So, what can you do beyond that? I think the easiest thing to do is to monitor the bugs that come in and out of your house which means traps. So they make traps specifically for carpet beetles and pantry pests. So like I said before, the Indian meal moths, uh, the tobacco moths, flower moths, that kind of stuff. Because those bugs, although most of them won't come around your stash. The carpet beetle will definitely come around your stash. And so having a, a, a trap that is specific for the pantry pest is great to have in your kitchen and then also by your stash. But then also by your stash, having a trap that is for the clothes moths. Um, they are pheromone based, so they do attract the male of the species to the trap and the males die. Uh, this is what I learned, well I learned all of this from working at the museum, but the trap and the monitoring of, monitoring of the traps really lets you know if you have a problem or not. These traps are, they probably last about a, a quarter, so like three months, four months max. I change them out quarterly and then I monitor them at the shop. I used to do them once a week and I probably say you look at them once a month. Once a week, if you start noticing you have bugs, then you're looking more. But if you're not and it's okay, then it's once a month to look at them. And I mean, all you have to do is put the trap out and then look at it, see if there's anything in there, and then just log it. And then every month, just see if there's anything added. If you're only getting one or two bugs a quarter, one bug a month, 
you probably don't have a problem. You're probably catching them before they become a problem. Uh, but if you start getting a lot of bugs in the trap, that's going to tell you that you have an issue and that you should be cleaning out your stash and cleaning out your drawers and doing laundry. So if you, you know, if you're anything like all of us, Sometimes this kind of stuff and the diligence that I'm talking about kind of goes out the window because life happens and there's just too many things to be on top of. So to help you along, this is a great way to do it. Meaning, if you get sidetracked and you don't move your stash around, you're not paying attention to your stash, but you look at this trap once in a while and you suddenly notice, hey, there's an uptick in the amount of bugs that are trapped maybe I have an issue and that'll get you thinking, hmm, what was the last time I rotated my stash? And then you can go and mess around with it. So traps, probably the cheapest. It's, they're super cheap. You, they don't cost a lot and they really will save you a lot of heartache. Trust me. If you have any questions about bugs in your stash, <laughs> If I didn't go over anything that you have questions about, please comment below or get in touch with me in some other fashion. I would love to help you out. If this was a helpful video, please give it a thumbs up and of course subscribe to my channel to stay connected to me and Frame and Fiber and the community here. So yeah, happy stashing and chasing those bugs away. <laughs> Until next time, bye!